Wild Wild, Wild West. West. The Wild Wild, Wild West. West. Well, welcome back to the Wild West Crypto Show. This is Brent. And I'm Drew. And we have with us today Ronnie Moaz. Yes, sir. He's not in the house, but he is in the house. He's in the house. Welcome, Ronnie. Thank you for having me. Well, as you know, this is the schoolhouse segment. Normally, we talk about all kinds of things, but mainly those kinds of things to kind of educate our our listeners. And of course, I always talk about my redneck buddies out there driving uh, manual transmission trucks like me and all that kind of stuff. But today, we're gonna we're, Ronnie and I are gonna have a a, a love fest. <laughs> there you uh, go. And and a love fest of commiserating as being some of the people that make the hard calls actually move the money, make the decision, make the trade, and then have to live by what happens. And so, you know, uh, Ronnie, uh, tell, you are a very, very, very highly rated analyst. Uh, your, your audited results are kind of off the charts. Uh, you have added crypto to your space of, of analysis. And in, in fact, I think you mentioned earlier, you even have a, a website, I think it's a, a philanthropyandphilosophy.com that does some analysis on charities and things like that. But you have a proven track record uh, in regards to uh, looking at securities, investments, and all those kinds of things with a very impressive track record. But yet you seem to catch hell in, in the Twitter sphere with just certain people who, uh, who can't give it a rest. Well, yeah, I, I have a top 20 ranking versus 4,700 people for my performance for the last 10 years. And every single one of the 700 recommendations that I put out was timestamped intraday by at least three different newswires, including Bloomberg and Dow Jones. So no one can dispute my track record. As far as the people on Twitter, I have 45,000 people following me on Twitter, and there are a few hundred idiots there. <laughs> it, it, goes with the, it goes with the territory. There are going to be people taking cheap shots at you the same way they take cheap shots at me. But it's, it's, a, it's a small fraction of the people. They are, they are trolls. They are living in their parents' basements. I don't know where they operate out of. And uh, sometimes you can't ignore them because they post stuff on the internet that's not true. And if you don't ignore it, if you don't respond to it, People seeing that assume it is true. Yeah. So people that say just ignore them, you can't. Sometimes they do some things that can be really damaging. And uh, I am very outspoken. I'm also Jewish, so the anti-Semitic people will go after me. I'm also liberal. Li liberal. I have not hidden how I feel about Donald Trump. So I have people that don't like me. And, uh, and you have to understand, 90% of the 3,000 people that are subscribers of mine signed up with me at the top of the crypto market in December and January. So most of the people that signed up with me lost half of their money, in some cases, three quarters of their money. So there are going to be people that are upset and will blame me for the fact that Bitcoin dropped 70%. But even though they signed up at 20,000, I told people, you're not, your timing here is less than perfect. Uh, I recommended Bitcoin at $2,570, not at $20,000. If you want to sign up for my service, I think you will do well. But we might have a nasty correction between, 20, between the time we go from $20,000 to $40,000 or $50,000. We might see $10,000 beforehand. And uh, so I, I, I encourage people, even at Bitcoin 20000 to get into the game because I think Bitcoin at $20,000 is undervalued relative to where I think it will be after we go through the next halving event in May of 2020. Well, and you know, one of the, one of the things, and, and see, I started with Merrill Lynch in 1982. I was with uh, Merrill in the, in the Fort Worth, Texas office. And in fact, I did real well. I did a lot of covered call writing back in those days because you could buy uh, Dow, uh, uh, DuPont, uh, Upjohn, you know, all kinds of nice stocks that were going to pay you 45 to 5% in dividend scale. And I'd make another 15% just trading three or four uh, covered call turns in a year. And so I had accounts making you know, 20, 25% return. But I always got called on the carpet because I wasn't selling Merrill Lynch's mutual funds. And I was first quintile producer, but you know, that didn't matter because I wasn't selling the stuff that they wanted. What most people don't understand is, is that a lot of the analysis, and especially a lot of the analysis of the big wire houses, is almost kind of uh, backward looking. 
you know, they'll they'll release a report that says, you know, things are starting to look favorable for X Y Z, and then when X Y Z takes off, that was oh, I made the call, you know, back there uh, three months ago, I said things were starting to look favorable, you know, I'm I'm a genius, you know. And do you know why? Do you know why I have my top twenty ranking? Why? Do you know what the reason is because I did the exact opposite of what the big houses tell you to do. What, what, you know, what on earth could be more ridiculous than downgrading a name the day after it drops 20% on bad news? Yeah. I'm buying that news. Yeah. I'm not selling it. Yeah. I mean, you're an analyst. You should have told me two days before it dropped that it was going down. Don't tell me after it dropped that you're downgrading the name. That's when you buy something. That's not when you sell it. That's like someone telling me in 2008 when the market crashed, we think you should get out of the market. Guess what? People listen to them and they missed a 400 percent move in the last 10 years. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, being, being I was pretty much a contrarian by birth almost. And so still you know, are. You still carry that. Yeah. yeah. But when it, whenever I would be into something and all of a sudden I noticed that Merrill was really uh, uh, touting it or it was falling in favor with them, I'd have to go back and and check all the analysis that I did because I kind of I imagine you and I might not be too far apart. I, I gave credence to technical analysis because that does show you. In fact, back in those days, there was a guy named Joe Granville that had a, a technique called on balance volume. And, and in fact, that's kind of the foundation of a lot of what's out there today. But what you get to realize is, is that being a contrarian, you know, only 20% of the money managers beat the other 80% or beat the indices. It's actually less than that after the fees that they charge you. Correct, correct. And so, you know, when you look at it, you don't want to go with the crowd. In fact, I tell people investing is kind of like a high school party. You want to get there early. You want to get your beer before everybody else. And when the and when the geeky kids start showing up, you want to leave because the cops are right behind. <laughs> Tell that to uh, Kavanaugh. Say what? <laughs> Tell that to Kavanaugh. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. If he actually stayed around, he should have left when he and his friends showed up. <laughs> so I think he's testifying right now, actually, as we're speaking. <laughs> oh, yes, that's true. So let me ask you. Uh, let me ask you this question: Do you uh, you worked for the wirehouses for a while? What what was the thing that compelled you to go out on your own? Uh, actually, I, I want to backtrack for one second. You mentioned Merrill Lynch. I've only had one job on Wall Street when I got out of graduate school. Uh, I got out of graduate school in 1998. I was already 31 years old at the time because I was in the music industry in Israel and I served in the Israeli army. So I didn't get out of graduate school until I was 31 years old. And the reason I'm mentioning this, the person who hired me out of graduate school was John Herzog from Herzog Hein Gedul. That was the number one market maker on the NASDAQ. And in yeah. 2000, Merrill Lynch bought them out. Do you remember that? Well, actually, you know what? I had left Merrill by then. Oh, well, Buzzy Gadul, Buzzy Gadul, and John Herzog from Herzog and Gadul oh, yeah. were bought out by Merrill Lynch, and that's when I left. And I've been on my own for the last eighteen years. Um, yeah, so I only worked for one one firm, and it wasn't a big firm. It, they had a they were a big market maker on the Nasdaq, but their trading operations were in New Jersey. That was ninety percent of their business. I was in that small area in New York on Broadway, next to the Bull Statue. <laughs> uh, where they had a few stockbrokers, and I would give the brokers stock recommendations, and they would then pitch those to their to their um, to their clients. Yeah. So let me ask you this, and because one of the things that I've talked about in the schoolhouse for the last number of weeks is is about the the relatively thin. Um, a float that there is in a lot of these cryptocurrencies. And, you know, there's a number of people out there that are just day trading the snot out of it. And, and they're day trading the snot out of it with somebody else that's day, day trading the snot out of it. And then there's actually some pretty large flows trying to get their way in. And in fact, we, we know of, of some, some big blocks that are trying to trade privately so that they can actually get the size that they need. And, and the, you know, they're haggling over what kind of discount they get or so on and so forth. What do you believe, and I certainly kind of believe, that one of the things that will really help crypto is is a little bit more standardization in regards to, to the trading platforms of where you can actually access the securities or access the coins? Uh, 
this is a big problem. Uh, I, I just don't know how they will be able to, I don't know how they will be able to regulate this. I mean, there are 2,000 names right now on coin market cap, and many of them only trade a few hundred thousand dollars a day, a couple of million dollars a day, which means you could go in right now and dump a hundred thousand dollars, sell a hundred thousand dollars of that name without a limit, market order, and knock the price down 20 or 30 percent in five minutes. And that creates a panic and a capitulation. And as it's capitulating, you quietly come in and buy back two or three times what you sold for less than what you buy back two or three times what you sold for pennies on the dollar. And if a coin has five or 10 or 15,000 shareholders or coin holders, it only takes a few bad apples to cause chaos and volatility in these names. And you really have to know how to recognize when a name is being manipulated. And when you see one of those red long candles that the technical analysts tell you to sell, you're actually supposed to be buying those because it was someone's attempt to manipulate the name. So, so there you hear it, folks. Uh, the 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 uh, Ronnie the Contrarian is letting you know that with that long red candle is a buy. It's not a sell. Yeah. By any stretch of imagination, especially if you're committed to this space in the long term. And unfortunately, you know, uh, you know, they talk about the hodls. Well, you know, um, part of the problem I think is is that there are a lot of people that have tried to come in with technical analysis and do day trading in a thinly traded market and are really kind of probably just chewing themselves up where if they take a little bit longer view and, and look at things kind of with some of the analysis that, uh, that Ronnie gives you uh, and look at it over a span of several years, you're going to do yourself a lot a lot better. Yeah. Um, you know, any way that you slice it. So. Uh, just a word to the wise, all you that are out there that are involved in the crypto space, you know, you might want to lengthen out your time horizon a little bit and, and relax because the blockchain is for real. Uh, Ronnie Boaz is for real. And and basically the coins that you're in, you know, unless it's, uh, uh, what did you call those shit coins? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unless it's one of the shit coins, well, then you're going to be all right. Well, 95% of the names have lost more than 85% of their value since January. And that's what they are. I mean, 95% of these names are scams, pump and dumps. There's no regulation. It's the Wild West, okay? And, and that's the problem, you know? And, uh, and I, I tell people, don't try to be a hero. Uh, you just focus on the names that are in the top 25 or the top 50, which is the way people made money in the NASDAQ 20 years ago. The market sent you a clear signal during the NASDAQ bubble. Don't buy Johnny.com and, and Stephen.com. Buy Cisco, Intel, Amazon, Microsoft, right. and Juniper, and all those names that are in the top 20 and hold on to them. Don't go into the gutter trying to make a million dollars overnight because you're going to end up losing your money. Yeah, well, absolutely. I'll tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't sum it up better. That's kind of that's kind of the sum of the bumper sticker, although it might be a little bit long, but a good bumper sticker for the schoolhouse segment. Ronnie, I want to thank you so much for your time. Look forward to getting to meet you personally, and then hopefully we'll get you back here on the Wild West Crypto Show. I will see you in Houston in three weeks. All right. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Folks, this is Wild West Crypto Show. You can find us everywhere. <laughs> <laughs>